Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, or wherever you are joining us from, across the country and around the world. We are so excited to have you, whether this is your first time tuning in or you are a regular. And we are just thrilled that you have decided to spend the next hour with us as we sing songs and we open up God's Word and we study together. Today is no exception. We always start with your favorite requests. And I will tell you that this song we're going to sing, A Child of the King, is a huge favorite. It's right up there, right behind Amazing Grace, which is like the most popular song request that we get. But A Child of the King, there must have been at least 60 requests for this song. So we are absolutely going to sing that with you right now. So if you are at home, pull out your hymnals. Join us, 468, A Child of the King. And of those 60 names, I picked the most exotic locations. Edward in Belize requested this. Melanie in China. Um, Mil Milikis in Ethiopia. Charlie in Fiji. Elsa in Macau. Billy and Maureen and Lekka in New Zealand. And Francis in Sri Lanka. So thank you to everybody that sent in that request. I cannot say all of your names, but you know who you are, and so does the Lord. 468, first, second, and fourth stanza. Join with us. I love four-part harmony, and it's so exciting to have a real bass and tenor and alto. And, of course, then you get brothers, and their harmony already is great. So I love it. I love it. And 
I love hearing from so many of you with your favorite requests. And of course, we are learning our new song, which is number 97 this week. Number 97 is The Lord of the Boundless Curves of Space. And two people actually did request this song. We have never heard this one. Um, Jaku in New York and Joyce in Kenya. So we are going to learn this all together. And we're going to sing all four stanzas, number 97. Join with us. to that song, that second stanza, your mind conceived the galaxies and each atom's secret plan, the huge expanse of space, and then the little atoms. And no matter where you fall into that spectrum, we're down on the atom side of it, that he knows everything about you. And even, you know, the sparrow that falls, the hair that falls from your head, he is aware of that, and he knows that. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for loving us, for being our truly our loving Heavenly Father. You love us, you watch over us, and you know everything about us. And we thank you for your love, for your mercy, and I pray that you will speak to our hearts today, help us to be open and receptive to what we hear. Be with Pastor Doug. Thank you so much um, for his ministry here and around the world. And each of our extended Sabbath School family, wherever they are, thank you for each one. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our lesson study is going to be brought to us by, yep, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you to our musicians. Debbie said that like she wasn't sure I was here. She kind of looked, is he here? Yeah. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, friends. Good to see each of you here. And again, I want to welcome the extended class that uh, is watching via satellite or internet uh, around the world. Yeah, we've been traveling a lot this summer doing um, uh, AFCO. AFCO stands for Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism or College of Evangelism. We take evangelism training around the country. And last week we were with our friends in Kansas City. We had over 1,300 people who showed up. Next week we're down in the uh, Southern California area at the uh, Indonesian church in uh, Redlands. And so there'll be a lot more than our Indonesian brothers and sisters there. And we're going to come together and study. So I want to greet everywhere I go. People say, oh, we study with you. We're continuing with our new study dealing with Christ and his law. And uh, in a moment, we'll get to lesson number four, but we always offer something that helps complement the lesson. And we have a free offer today. It's called A Love That Transformed. This really is a good lesson. It talks about the principles of the law, holy living, 
And, uh, you know, we talk about grace and justification, but there's also sanctification. This talks about that. The power of that grace and that love transforms us. We'll send you a free copy of this, a love that transforms. Just call the number on the screen, which is 866-STUDY-MORE. That translates to 866-788-3966. And when you do ask for offer number 710, we'll be happy to send that to you. All right, the lesson is Christ and the law in the Sermon on the Mount. This is very important. I'll explain why in just a minute. The memory verse is Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Most of you should know that, but I'd like you to say it with me. You ready? And this is from the New King James Version. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now this is a very important study because how many of you have heard before that yes, in the Old Testament, God had his law and you've got the Ten Commandments, but then Jesus came, and now we're living under the new dispensation where Christ gave us a new law. And that the law of Jesus is different from the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament law. How many of you have heard that before, some variation of that before? That is categorically not true. That actually is a doctrine of devils. Because it almost makes it sound like you've got different gods. You've got the God and the law of the Old Testament, and then Jesus came to really straighten things out. They were saved by works in the Old Testament, but we are saved by faith and grace now. Have you heard that before? Nobody's saved by works. Nobody can be saved by works. Nobody ever could be saved by works. In the Old Testament, they were saved by faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. They were saved by faith looking forward. All the sacrificing of lambs, that all pointed forward to the coming of the Lamb of God. And it wasn't a different God that thought up the sacrificial system, it was Jesus. And it wasn't a different God that gave the Ten Commandments, that was Jesus. And the teachings of Jesus perfectly complement the teachings of the Old Testament. And so it's important to understand that when we talk about Christ and his law, even the title of the lesson, I was afraid some would misunderstand. Christ and his law is not just talking about the New Testament laws. Because who was it that gave the Old Testament law? Christ. And so when you talk about Christ and his law, don't be thinking in your mind, well, this must just mean the New Testament law. The, the quarterly does principally deal with that, but it's the same law. And that's something that's brought out um, powerfully, I think, in, uh, in this study. For instance, our memory verse. Jesus says, do not think. And what does that mean? Don't think this, right? I mean, just simple as reading. Can't misunderstand. Do not think I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but fulfill. Okay, stop. Some people think that Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament law, and that means he came to abolish or do away with it. Now, if Jesus saying I came to fulfill the Old Testament law means I came to abolish it, listen to how silly that'll sound. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to do away with. Wouldn't that be the same thing? Uh, th that would be a contradiction. So what does fulfill mean? When Jesus came to John the Baptist to get baptized, and John, recognizing he was the Messiah, said, Lord, what's going on here? I need to be baptized by you, I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus said to John, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it's appropriate to fulfill all righteousness. Now, does fulfill mean do away with? <laughs> does fulfill mean abolish? Would Jesus have said to John, you need to baptize me to abolish all righteousness and do away with all righteousness? No. Fulfill all righteousness, it means to fill full. It means to complete so Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fill it up in his life, to make it complete. See, the Old Testament law still was not complete in that they didn't understand all the underlying principles. In the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to study this morning, 
Jesus takes the law and he unpacks it and he makes it complete so that they can comprehend it. Um, someone look up for me. All right, let me just see where the microphones are. Okay, we got one here. Someone look up for me, Psalm 119, verse 142. Who has that? Right hand right here. We'll get you a microphone. And I don't know where you might be that has Isaiah 40, verse 8. Is that a different side? You have that verse? Okay, so you'll be up next, but it'll be a minute, Melissa, okay? Now, here's a very important verse. Isaiah 51, 7. Oh, I Isaiah 42, 21, sorry. Go with me to Isaiah 42, verse 21. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Now, this is a section that is talking about the Messiah. What would the Messiah do? Magnify. Is that like delete, the delete key on your keyboard? I've got another function on my keyboard where if I press the control button and I scroll, it makes anything on my screen get bigger. It's wonderful. Because as you get older, you use that more. Magnify. And uh, so what does magnify mean? Make bigger or make smaller? Does it make something more blurry, obscure, or does it make it something more clear and sharp? So did Jesus come to do away with or to make it more clear? That's what it means to fulfill it, to make it more uh, crisp. He came to magnify the law and make it honorable. Why did he make it honorable? Because some of the man-made traditions that the religious leaders had put on the laws brought shame and reproach. The Sabbath law is good. And Jesus often had conflict with others because he'd healed somebody on the Sabbath. And he became angry with him. One day there was this man who had a withered hand in the church on the Sabbath. And Jesus asked them, he says, is it better to do good on the Sabbath or evil? And they wouldn't answer him. How many of you that has a sheep or a donkey that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, they will not pull it out? And they wouldn't answer him. And so Jesus was angered. He was grieved at their, the hardness of their hearts and he told the man, stretch forth your hand and he healed them. Because the idea that a donkey or a sheep was more important than a man, the pagans would laugh at the way some of the religious leaders kept the law. It was dishonored because of the traditions that eclipsed the commandments. So Jesus came to make it honorable so that others would say, oh, it's a beautiful law, it's a wonderful law, it's a fair law. All right, go with me now to Psalm 119. Uh, you're going to read that for us, Aaron, verse 142, I think. Psalms 119, 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Now, the first part of the Sermon on the Mount deals with something called the Beatitudes. As a matter of fact, if you look in your lesson, you'll see in the first page of your lesson, it says that the Sermon on the Mount's really divided up into four or five sections if you can count the conclusion as a section. You got the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 1 through 12. You got the section on light and salt in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Then there's a long section where Jesus gives a deeper perspective on the law. And then you've got a long section on Christian behavior, and that's Matthew 6 through the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And he concludes then with the wise and foolish builder on whether or not you will listen to what he had said previously. If you have a red letter version of your Bible, you'll notice the longest uninterrupted red letter section is the Sermon on the Mount. It is a sermon that Jesus preaches. And it's, you know, it doesn't take that long for you to read through it, but it's pretty powerful. Look how often it's quoted. But the first part of that sermon we just told you is the Beatitudes. Do we see the Ten Commandments listed in the Beatitudes? Is the law of God reflected in there? Is he doing away with it? Well, we just heard Aaron read, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, thy law is truth. Is there a beatitude that talks about righteousness? Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. Um, Isaiah 51, 7. Hearken unto me, you that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Is there a connection between righteousness and the law? Yeah, we just read that. And so the Beatitudes are connected with the law. Let me give you another example. What does uh, the Beatitudes say in Matthew 5, 7? Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. 
All right? If you look then, for example, in Exodus 20, verse 6, in the Ten Commandments, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What commandment is that in? That's in the Ten Commandments, and more specifically, that's in the commandment about idolatry, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, but showing mercy. Everyone gets hung up on the third and fourth generation. They don't read the rest of it. Showing mercy unto them that love me. See, do you know in the Ten Commandments it says, love me and keep my commandments? The key to the Ten Commandments is in the Ten Commandments. Love me and keep my commandments. It's right in there. Is there a uh, beatitude that talks about purity? Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And is there a connection between purity and the law? 1 Peter 1, I know I'm going to the New Testament. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, obedience and purity. There's a connection there with the law. And then Jesus goes on to say in uh, Luke 16, and this is under the section. Actually, everything I said thus far was an introduction. In um, Luke chapter 16, verse 17, under one jot or tittle, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. Now, in, in our, just to make this similar to our vernacular, when we write, you've got a little dash or the crossing of a T. That was the Jewish equivalent in their characters for a tittle. It was a little like an accent mark. And a jot was like what we would call the period that we use on a sentence. In Hebrew writing, they did have these little, the very smallest marks they would make in their writing. Jesus said it would be easier for heaven and earth to vaporize and pass away than for even a jot or a tittle to fail from the law of God. So is Jesus saying that I came to change or do away with the law? And yet, do you hear Christians teach that? Yes. Now, there are things in the law that Christ replaced in that they were symbols that pointed to him. The laws about sacrificing lambs. Do we need to sacrifice lambs anymore? No. Well, we do. It's Jesus as our lamb. We accept him as our sacrifice, right? And so it's really those things still apply, but Jesus is the lamb. And you can look at the laws that they had about the feasts and circumcision, and Paul is very clear. Those laws that came later, they were symbolic. Um, matter of fact, the ceremonial laws and the feast days, they all came after um, sin entered the world. The Ten Commandments really existed from the very beginning. Was it wrong to commit murder um, back in the days of Adam and Eve? Did God look down on Cain killing his brother? Um, was adultery wrong before the Ten Commandments were written? Did God tell Joseph uh, that, you know, misbehaving with Potiphar's wife would be a sin? Isn't that what Joseph said? How can I do this thing and sin against God? So they knew that stealing was wrong before the Ten Commandments were written. They knew that lying was wrong. And you can find examples of this even long before the Ten Commandments were written. And so these are eternal principles. The ceremonial laws and some of these things relating to sacrifices that were shadows, yes, they were nailed to the cross, they were written on paper, they point to Jesus. But the principles that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount, they're eternal principles. All right, read for us Isaiah 40, verse 8, please. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The Ten Commandments are eternal principles. It is true that Jesus has summarized the Ten Commandments. Um, matter of fact, someone look up for me Matthew 7, verse 12. Who got that? Got a hand over here? Let's get you a microphone. Matthew said, we'll get to you in just a minute. Matthew 7, verse 12. Jesus did summarize the Ten Commandments. If you were to summarize the Ten Commandments in one word, what would it be? Love. How many agree? 
And then if you are going to summarize the Ten Commandments, if you're going to divide that in two, into two principles, what would it be? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor. Well, that's the new commandment that Jesus gave that replaces the old. Have you heard that? We don't need to keep the Ten Commandments because Jesus gave us a new commandment because he said, a new commandment I give unto you. I mean, he said it. But then when he articulates the new commandment, when he states it, what is he doing? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. He's quoting Leviticus 19.18. So Jesus, when he says a new commandment, and then he quotes the Old Testament, he quotes Moses more specifically, how new was it to the Jews? It wasn't new. He said it's a new principle for you to understand that all of the law is summarized in love, right? Uh, this would probably be a good time to read that next verse if we're ready. Yeah, uh, Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. All of the law and the prophets are not done away with, Jesus said. They are summarized and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There's a law that says if you find your neighbor's donkey wandering out on its own, even if he's your enemy, the Bible says take it back to him. It's someone you can't stand. You just got this difficult neighbor and he just makes you miserable. And you see his don donkey's wandered off, you can say, oh great, I'm glad it's happening to him. No, God says that's not the right attitude. Go get his donkey, bring it back to him. Overcome evil with good. Well, that's the, the teaching of Jesus. That's in the law of Moses. Whatever you would have others do to you, do also to them. It summarizes love for God and love for your fellow man. Now, one reason we know the law is not done away with is if you look, for instance, in Revelation eleven nineteen. Revelation eleven nineteen. It says, then the temple of God was open in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Now, when is this happening prophetically? This is happening, you know, in the sequence of Revelation. It's not in the early days of the church history. It's in the final events. The temple of God was open in heaven. Certainly, it's after the time of Christ. How did the ark get to be in heaven? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some letters on this. Where is the ark now? The ark, the, the um, ark, you know, the golden box, not Noah's ark, the ark, the golden box that has the Ten Commandments in it, as near as we can tell, and I think there's a reference to this in Prophets and Kings, before Nebuchadnezzar conquered, before he destroyed Jerusalem, Jeremiah, knowing it was coming, he conspiring with some of the loyal priests, not wanting the most sacred national object to be taken captive. See, the ark was cap taken captive once by the Philistines. They didn't want that ever to happen again. They knew that the Babylonians were going to take the city. Jeremiah told them it was going to happen. They couldn't hide everything in the temple, but they took the ark and they hid it in one of the many caves. There is an absolute honeycomb of caves and tunnels underneath Jerusalem. Every time they started building on Jerusalem, they find another cave or tunnel. They had, they had graves that they dug in and around the city. They hid it somewhere. They found a very good obscure spot. They blocked the entrance, somehow covered it with dirt, and it has never been found since. No, it's not in Egypt. It's not in Ethiopia. It is still secreted somewhere in a cave, probably within a stone's throw of the walls of uh, ancient Jerusalem. So when it says the temple was open in heaven, I saw the ark. Which one is that? Everything in the temple on earth was patterned after the original in heaven. Now, what's in the ark? The words of God. Just thinking to myself right now, I, I don't know, so don't, don't say Pastor Doug is teaching heresy. How many stones were there in the Ten Commandments? Two, right? Is that right? It says on two tables of stone. And which side of the stone was written on? Both sides. So what did God do? Did he put the first four commandments on one stone and the last 
Uh, six commandments on the other stone, front and back? Maybe. Let me give you something else to think about. What is a covenant? Covenant's a contract. How many of you have ever signed a covenant to buy a house or to borrow money from a bank or to sell a car or something like that? Every now and then we'll wear out a car and Karen and I will sell it to somebody, or at least we wear it out for what, what we want to use it and we're looking for another one. And I'll sell it to a private party. And when we have uh, an agreement of sale, I explain I'm not an auto dealer. I'm not selling it with a warranty. I'm as honest as I can and say, here's a car. And I said, let's write this up. I'll sign it. You sign it. I get a copy. You get a copy. Isn't that what you do with a covenant? You can think about any covenant you can think of is that you both have a copy. So you can prove that this was an agreement that you both agreed to. And you both signed both copies. Right? So if God made a covenant with Israel, how many copies are there? Must be two. Now, I don't know if that means. Again, I don't know. I don't know if that means that the Ten Commandments were two copies of the same that were put in the ark, or if it means that it took two stones, both sides, for one copy, and God has the uh, other in heaven. The one in heaven may not be written on granite. God doesn't need to carve it out of a stone. But I don't know what it's written on. It could be. It could be on some gem. It could be on sapphire or something. But why does Jesus say it'll be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail? Because you would have to go to heaven and take his copy to destroy it, right? That's right? So I heard one pastor say, if you look up and the heaven's still there, if you look down and the earth is still there, that means God's law is still there and it has not changed. And as I've often said, the law doesn't need changing. The purpose of the gospel is to transform or to change us. All right. Now we're going to talk about the section of the law in the um, uh, Sermon on the Mount. If you look, for instance, in Matthew 22, um, and uh, we read through verse 40. No, I'm sorry, Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, I've heard some pastors say, see, God hung the law like you might hang a horse thief, that it's been destroyed somehow, hung up and shot down. But that's not at all what it means. It means it's kind of like it, you ever gone into someone's house, especially in colder climates, and... Uh, you know, I just came from Kansas, and you go up to Michigan, and a lot of the houses there, you don't walk, open the front door and just walk in like you do here in California into the living room. You open the front door and you walk into like a vestibule because that, it's so much cold weather that you need a place to kind of shake the snow off and hang your jackets up. Yeah, how many of you know what I'm talking about? It's like you almost got two entrances to the house. Otherwise, you open the cold door and that 40 below zero wind whistles right through the house in an instant. And you hang up your coat it's a place of respect to keep it off the ground, away from the mud. It means it, it, everything is held up by these two commandments. This, these are the two laws upon which all the other laws hang. You can find some way. Let me say this differently. People are always saying, you know, there's nothing, nothing in the Bible that says, like, thou shalt not smoke cigarettes. Nothing in the Bible says thou shalt not gamble. I, I get these kind of statements. Nothing that says you shall not use heroin or marijuana. I actually picked up a hitchhiker one time, serious, absolutely serious. He was on Highway 101. He was dressed all in white. He had long hair, and he was barefoot. And he was wearing a white robe. And as I saw him standing on the road, I thought, you know, I've got to find out what the story is behind this, so I've got to pick this guy up. <laughs> I knew I was in for something, but I thought, he's hitchhiking. He doesn't look dangerous. He, He's pretty spartanly dressed. <laughs> so I picked him up, and we drove down the road for a little while. And he said, uh, somehow, I, the subject of religion came up. I don't know. I think I had a Bible on my dashboard. He said, oh, you're a Christian. I said, yeah. And he said, uh, do you believe the Bible? I said, absolutely, every word. He said, then uh, why do you got leather on your Bible? I said, pardon me? He said, if you really believe the Bible, he says, oh, you shouldn't have those filthy leather shoes on. 
He says, you're probably wearing a leather belt too. As a matter of fact, I am. And he said, you know, you're killing animals by doing that. And I said, well, it might surprise you to know I'm a vegetarian. He says, why are you doing all that? <laughs> and he was of this group of Christians that not only believed you should not wear any leather, but he also believed that we're supposed to smoke a lot of marijuana at the same time. And so, uh, uh, and I don't remember how that came up, but he said, yeah, do you partake of, but it was his religion. He said, you know, God reveals himself through the things he's made. And he said, he made every herb for us. And so he smoked marijuana, <laughs> a lot of it. And when he got in the car, I could tell right away. Because <laughs> I remember what it smelled like. <laughs> and I thought, boy, that was very interesting. He was using the Bible. But the, I meet people that say, they try to use the Bible to say that, well, you know, there's principles in the Bible. But I used to use the Bible to say, it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you. So there's nothing wrong with smoking. But if what goes in your mouth defiles what comes out of your mouth, then it's wrong. First of all, what it does to your breath is one thing. But when a person drinks, does what goes in defile what comes out? Yeah. And so I, I was trying to share some of the other principles with this fellow uh, of natural living. Anyway, it was just very interesting. But I don't really think there's a sin that you can name that is somehow not covered under the canopy of the Ten Commandments. I believe the Ten Commandments are so beautifully written, they are concise, they are succinct, but they are comprehensive in that in some way, the principle thou shalt not kill. When you do things like smoke, cigarettes and other things, you are slowly killing yourself. Uh, you, can, you can't really name a sin, thou shalt not steal gambling. You're trying to get rich quick at the expense of others who are becoming addicted and losing everything. And um, so for you to get rich quick, another person gets nothing for their money. It's not like making a purchase. They get nothing for their money and you pay, you do nothing to get their money if you happen to win that way. And so there's a principle in the Ten Commandments that would virtually cover anything. And so um, I've actually heard young people say, well, yeah, the Bible says don't commit adultery, but it doesn't say you can't sleep with another person if neither of you are married. I said, no, the thou not, shalt not commit adultery commandment covers fornication as well because Jesus uses it that way too. And so the Ten Commandments are broad and comprehensive and they cover everything. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 27. Christ, when he began to teach, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. How many of the scriptures? All the prophets, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. That was Matthew 24, 27. The statement Jesus makes to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. This is very important. So the law of Christ, does it conflict with the law of God in the Old Testament? The law of Christ and the law of God in the Old Testament are in perfect harmony. When Jesus wanted to prove he was the Messiah, he took those two disciples <clears throat> and he pointed them back to the law in the prophets. And he said, all of this was pointing to me. In fact, um, if you look, this is a, a verse I think is often misunderstood. Matthew eleven thirteen. Matthew eleven thirteen. You'll find a parallel verse for this in Luke also. For all of the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now, what did he mean by that? You know what I've heard? I've heard people say, with John the Baptist, the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament law ended. They said, with the Ten Commandments, I'm sorry, with John the Baptist's ministry, when he introduced Jesus, it says all of that stuff reached until the time of Christ and then it ended with John the Baptist. Really? Then why did Jesus keep it? And the other thing is, it's really saying all of the law and all of the prophets pointed to the time when John would announce here is the Messiah. Here is the fulfillment of all that the law and the prophets have spoken about. It doesn't mean that all the law and the prophets ended 
with John the Baptist. It means the announcement of John the Baptist pointed to all that the law and the prophets had encompassed. So Jesus fulfills all that, meaning he fills it all full. He doesn't do away with it. That's again, it, he, it says he came to magnify the law and to make it honorable. All right, someone who has John 15, verse 10. Got a hand over here? We'll get you a microphone. John 15, verse 10. Now, if you look, for instance, in, um, in the Beatitudes, when we read uh, Mark 7, verse 9, what is the fifth commandment? Honor your father and your mother. Um, actually, I was talking about, I, I said that when we look in the Sermon on the Mount, I'm looking in Mark's version of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says in Mark 7, verse 9, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you might keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. Isn't that one of the Ten Commandments? And he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if... Um, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin, a gift to God, then you no longer let them do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. Now, what does Jesus call the law of Moses? The word of God. He said, you are making the word of God of none effect. He didn't say that old law of Moses. He talks about it as it is still in force. Should people still honor their father and mother? Let me explain what Christ is talking about here. The Jewish leaders had fabricated a law where you could pronounce Corbin, you would make this oath and pronounce Corbin over your property, and that meant I am giving all of my estate to the church, to the temple, when I die. And people did this because it created a loophole. That meant you could use it as long as you live to take care of yourself but you couldn't give it to anybody else because it had been dedicated to God. Meaning when your mom and dad got old and they couldn't work anymore, you'd say, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry, I can't help you with my estate because I've given it to God. Now, doesn't that sound outrageous? But the priests had developed this law so that people could use their money as long as they want, as long as they would give the, when they died, they'd give it all to the church, whatever was left, their property, their house. And they couldn't help their mother and father in their old age. And Jesus said, you're hypocrites. You're breaking the commandment of God that says, honor your father and mother, and you're not caring for them in their age and infirmity. And you're claiming piety, and you're putting tradition ahead of the commandment of God. So how did Jesus feel about the Ten Commandments in his teaching? Did he do away with it? Or was he saying, no, you've got to sweep aside the man-made traditions and make it honorable. He came to magnify the law and make it honorable. Okay, we have John 15, 10. Where was that? Over here, Mike. John 15, 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. All right, now if you think Old Testament got the law of God the Father, New Testament, you've got the law of Jesus Christ. They're different laws. Which law did Jesus keep? Christ said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments even as I have kept my Father's commandments. So did Jesus keep the laws in the Old Testament? Did he? And then the Bible says, whoever says that he follows him ought to walk even as he walked. So if Jesus kept that, then we should keep it. And it's not talking about the sacrificing of lambs. It's talking about the, the principles of the law that you find in the Old Testament. He didn't do away with it. Look for, again, John 14, 15. How many believe it's important to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How do you get the Holy Spirit? John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And what's the rest of that say? And I will pray my Father, and he will send you another comforter, even the Spirit. The Bible tells us that God gives his Spirit to those that obey him, Acts chapter 4. Spirit's a power. God cannot entrust that power to people that will not submit to his will. And the perfect expression of God's will is his law. Yea, I love to do thy will. Thy law is in my heart. I think that's Psalms 119, verse 45. Huh? 40, verse 8. Thank you. Psalm 40, verse 8. That's what it is, yeah. 
So, yeah, Psalm, the other one I gave you is, I will walk at liberty, for I keep thy precepts. And so the law of God needs to be in our hearts. One more, 1 John 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, is John, this is John, the apostle of love, is he making a distinction between the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and the law of Jesus, or is he saying they're, they're one and the same? And this is how we show the love of God, by obeying his commandments. If you love someone, especially if they're a superior, and you know that you're doing something that disappoints them, that is good to do, then you're not showing love for them. All right, um, let's go to verse, Matthew 15, verse 9. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Whenever we put man-made uh, doctrines ahead of the commandments of God, Jesus says we're worshiping him in vain. Can you think of some laws that people are keeping in vain? Do sometimes people keep the wrong Sabbath? And they think they're keeping the commandments of God. It's man-made. All right, just to sh quickly show you some of the other examples of how the Sermon on the Mount supports the teachings of Christ and his law. If you look, for instance, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Let's go there real quick. Matthew 5, verse 21. It says, you have heard it said by those of old, you shall not murder. Now, where is that written? That's in the Ten Commandments, right? You've heard it said by those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders is in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, uh, that word fool there means you're worthless, shall be in danger of hellfire. Um, I just got to pause right here and explain something. Did Jesus ever call the disciples fools? He says, oh, fool oh foolish ones. He did several times. It's, it's a different kind of uh, emphasis. Christ is saying, don't ever say to someone you're worthless. And the other one is really talking about somebody just not knowing the word, or it's, a, it's an ignorance or a lack of faith. Because otherwise, it would seem like a conflict here. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that you have ought against your brother or he has something against you, leave your gift there. Now, he's talking about murder. Why does he say bring your gift to the altar? Where did the first murder take place? Two brothers brought gifts to the altar and they had animosity between themselves and one killed the other. Do people sometimes come to church that are brothers and sisters that have anger towards each other? And Jesus, they, they got murderous thoughts in their hearts. So is Jesus doing away with a law that says thou shalt not murder? in the Ten Commandments, or is he expanding it? See, he's showing there's not only the letter of the law, there's the spirit of the law. There's not only the action of disobedience, there's the attitude of disobedience that first happens that leads to the action of disobedience. And I'm running out of time, but I want to say this to just make it clear. Some people say, you guys, you Seventh-day Adventist Christians, you just make a big deal about keeping the letter of the law. I keep the spirit of the law. You worship God on the seventh day. I worship God every day. I keep the spirit of the law. <laughs> and I say, well, no, you're, you're not really keeping the spirit or the letter. Yes, it is true. Come unto me and I'll give you rest. And that's the spirit of the law. But whenever you keep the spirit of the law, you'll always keep the letter of the law. Follow me. The letter of the law says do not commit murder. The spirit of the law says do not be angry with your brother without a cause. If you say, I'm more spiritual than you and I keep the spirit of the law, I'm not angry with my brother in my heart. Yes, I may actually murder him or her, but I'm not angry in my heart. You're a liar. <laughs> because if you're breaking the spirit of the law, if you're breaking the letter of the law, you are definitely breaking the spirit of the law. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. The spirit of the law says, and Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you're committing adultery with her in your heart. And by the way, that works both ways. Man with a woman, woman with a man. So if a person says, oh, I, I just keep the spirit of the law. I don't look and I don't lust. I don't think it in my heart. Yes, I am actually committing adultery every day. But I don't think it in, I'm breaking the letter, but I'm keeping the spirit. Can you do that? 
So people who say, oh, I'm keeping the spirit of law, I'm resting in Jesus. Yes, I break every Sabbath. I work every Sabbath, but I'm resting in Jesus. No, you're not. You're not keeping the spirit and you're not keeping the letter. And when people say, you believe you're saved by works and I believe I'm saved by faith, I'm telling people to rest and they're saying to work on the Sabbath. So no, they're works oriented. I'm rest oriented. And they, it's, they twist it completely around. Everything you're going to find in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is supporting the Ten Commandments. He's magnifying it. He's not doing away with it. He said, do not think. Matter of fact, he goes on to say, if anyone thinks that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets, whoever will do this and teach it will be great in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever will break it will be spoken of as least in the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't mean they're in the kingdom. That means those in the kingdom point to those people and speak of them as the lowest. He said, whoever will break my commandments and teach others to do so will be lowest in the kingdom. That means the people in the kingdom consider that person the lowest person. They're not saved. I've heard some say, well, yeah, if you break it, you teach others to break it, you'll just have a low position in the kingdom. No, you're not in the kingdom. Those in the kingdom are speaking of you as the lowest kind of person. Those who do it and teach it will be spoken of as great. So yes, the devil will have even Christians accuse you of being a legalist if you teach the law. But Jesus taught the law. But we need to teach the spirit and the letter of the law. The whole thing. That's what Christ did. Amen? Now, don't teach us the letter of the law or you do become a legalist. You also need to teach us not just an action, it's an attitude. And we've got a lesson that we'll offer you for free that explains that. All you've got to do is call and ask for it. It's called a love that transforms. Call the number on your screen, 866-788-3966. Ask for offer number 710. We'll be delighted to send it to you for free. And uh, God bless you, friends, until we study together again next week. But time is up for now. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters, enhance your knowledge of the Bible, and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit the amazing Bible timeline at BibleHistory.com. Amazing facts change lives. like I was receiving some angel messages in around my son's death. My son Jesse was just 31 years old, so I didn't expect him to die before I did. But in November of 2009, we decided to have Thanksgiving with him and when we normally go to a family to have Thanksgiving. I didn't know that it was going to be the very last time that I would see my son alive. And in April of 2010, I was urged to call him on the day that he died. I didn't make that call. I was too busy. I thought I had till the next morning to call him. And it turns out that I didn't. And then my husband's father was passing away in a nursing home, slowly, not eating, taking his medicine, just wasting away. We were putting out amazing facts, Bible study guides, and we had sent out cards, and we had this card. But when I knocked on Sue and Kirk's door, by mistake. And we were convinced that this was the right house, and it obviously turned out to our surprise to be the wrong house. When they came by, uh, we weren't expecting them. I, they, he told me about these pamphlets, these uh, amazing facts uh, that explain their doctrine. Well, to our surprise, uh, when they answered the door, uh, the gentleman, uh, when he saw what we were doing, he said, uh, well, we would like to take these studies. Anything about the Lord that in increases my faith is always uh, open. These lessons came at a time when we didn't know we were searching. We didn't know what we needed. We were just hurting from the grief that we'd been through. When I saw the studies by Amazing Facts about the Sabbath, 
it struck a chord with me because I remembered when I had talked to my mother as a child about the Sabbath, about seeing that truth when I was only eight years old and asking her why we didn't honor the Sabbath day. And she told me that it was just not the way that they did things. Well, that, that wasn't a good enough expression, a good enough explanation. There was no scriptural basis for what she told me. She just said to forget it. And I'd went through all of the studies that we had gotten and I wanted more. So I decided that, well, if they put out these Amazing Facts Bible studies, there must be something online about them. So I decided to check it out. I went on the computer to Amazing Facts and it said it right down at the bottom of the Bible studies, amazingfacts.org. Checked it out and there was free Bible studies there. It was the very same ones that we had been studying after finding the Amazing Facts Bible Studies online, and I did them all, I think there were 27, 28 Bible Studies, I felt like I was finally seeing the truth after all these years. We ordered the Amazing Facts uh, DVDs, like the Cosmic Conflict and the Final Events, uh, Prophecy Foundations, and different materials like that. Went through them, enjoyed all of them, and they impacted our lives even more. Well, I worked at the post office. I knew Kirk and Sue for a very long time, and I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone about the Bible and Bible studies and things like that, because they had told us not to. But anyway, when Sue came in and, and talked about it, she talked about the Sabbath, and I told her, I said, well, Sue, I go to church on, on Saturday. So I invited myself. She was excited, of course, to have me go. My husband and I both started going that very next Sabbath. And it wasn't but just four months after that that we were baptized in this church. And it felt like the most glorious experience I could have ever had. The thing that uh, touches my heart the most is Merwin and I have been doing this for all oh, the last uh, year and a half or two years. And uh, Sue is not the only one that has responded to Amazing Facts. We've had several others that have responded and and have been baptized. So this this is what really uh, makes it exciting. There's times it's discouraging, but the bottom line is every time you see somebody uh, in the water being baptized, it's a thrill. I know that Jesus loves me. After all of the tragedy that I've been through, he made sure that the two men came and brought the Amazing Facts Bible studies to me and my husband. My life will never be the same. It is forever changed and I am forever part of the family of God.